Hello everyone, welcome back to UGC 112, World Civilizations 2. This is Lecture 7, The Enlightenment. So at the end of last lecture, we were noting the development of inductive reasoning, right? And I said that inductive reasoning wouldn't be limited to science, and that it would spread beyond that into the realm of philosophy. And that's what we're going to look at today through the Enlightenment. So what we really see is a growth in the importance of reason. We see reason becoming uh, the focus of thought over just belief. And during the French Revolution, reason was so important that it was even worshipped as a goddess and even the supreme being. So, reason is going to become very, very important, especially in France. The idea was that using reason, people thought they could enlighten the darkness of the medieval world. Um, and that really became one of the goals of the quote-unquote enlightenment. <clears throat> now, one example of this will be the divine rights of kings. We've mentioned this in the past, where, you know, kings basically just, they thought they could rule because God appointed them, right? So that's the medieval thought. God chose the king, so he must be obeyed. Now, during the Enlightenment, people began to question this. Yeah, you know, they would ask, well, how do you know God made him king? Where's the proof that this, besides the king himself saying that, or the church saying that, uh, is there any other proof besides the words of men? And we can see the importance of evidence, right? They're looking for proof of this, and that's really going to fit into the new form of reasoning that we talked about, inductive reasoning, right? So you'll think, you'll remember back that the old approach was deductive reasoning where you started from a theory and worked your way down to try to find supporting data um, and that was slowly replaced by inductive reasoning where you have all the data at first you try and gather as much as you can then you work your way back up towards your theory or your conclusion and so now this new kind of reasoning inductive reasoning was going to be uh, very influential on philosophy, and it's all the basis of this reasoning again is on facts, not theory. Before we even get to the Enlightenment, um, we should mention this figure here. This is Francis Bacon. He was alive during the times of Elizabeth I and James I in England. Um, he's an English nobleman and a scientist, a philosopher, and he really fits in with Kepler and Galileo for being a key figure in the development of inductive reasoning, right? Remember last time we talked about Kepler's work and Galileo's work of gathering all this evidence? Well, Bacon, he was another key figure during the scientific revolution, because he was a scientist, and he was especially influential on inductive reasoning and the scientific method. Basically what he did was he even wrote a work that he called The New Method, and this was going against what Aristotle had written. Um, it, it was meant to counter Aristotle, Aristotle's existing method. Uh, and it was basically the scientific method on steroids. Uh, it was, yeah, observations are the building blocks for understanding, and they had to be, you know, examined and made skeptically and carefully, and it was just so, so rigorous that uh, it was, it kind of went even beyond what eventually became the scientific method. But we can see observations are there, right? They're the basis of understanding. So, in many ways, 
it's the same idea as the scientific method. It's just overly complicated and like maybe a little too rigorous, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. And so the reason why we're talking about Francis Bacon to today and not in the last class is because besides being that scientist, he was also a philosopher and he would be very, very influential in the philosophers that we're going to look at today. So he's kind of the bridge guy um, between last lecture and what will be the, the heart of this lecture. Also, a little side note, uh, there's a theory that Francis Bacon was actually the one who wrote many of the works, if not all of the works, of Shakespeare. Um, this was really popular in the 19th century. I don't think many people actually really believe it today, uh, but there are still some followers who believe that Francis Bacon wrote the works of William Shakespeare. Another major influence in both science and philosophy, including, you know, the Enlightenment, which we're going to talk about, is this man here, René Descartes. He was a French mathematician and philosopher, and, again, he's pre-Enlightenment, so we're still a little bit before, um, you know, what this lecture is called, at least, but he's an important figure. And... You may recognize his name, right? René Descartes. But even if you don't recognize his name, you are probably very familiar with some of his work. If you think back to high school geometry, Descartes is the one who invented the Cartesian plane. It's named after him, right? Cartesian plane, Descartes. Um, and with the Cartesian plane, he was able to link algebra and Euclidean geometry together. Among his many contributions, this was just one of the you know, major ones that is really, really prevalent today. And a lot of his work influenced people like Isaac Newton and other mathematicians like that. Now, Rene Descartes was also the man who famously wrote Cogito Ergo Sum, I Think, Therefore I Am. And what he means here by thinking is being skeptical, right? So it's not just, you know, it's, it's the idea that he is thinking skeptically about his existence and that he's questioning it that makes him aware that he does exist, in fact. And this is all part of the method of doubt, or sometimes it's even called Cartesian skepticism, again, after Descartes. And the idea is that you apply skepticism and doubt to all knowledge. So you have to look at every piece of knowledge with, skepti uh, with skepticism and looking at it full of doubt. And doing so, you can sort out what is true and what is false. So that's Descartes there. Yet another pre-Enlightenment thought thinker who would have a profound influence on the Enlightenment is this man here, John Locke. He's an English physician and philosopher. He wrote about just a ton of different things religious tolerance and that there should be separation between church and state. He would write on the, the natural equality of people and argued against uh, the divine right of kings. He thought legitimate governments needed popular consent to rule, and he even said that people had a right to revolt against a government that was acting against them. He also believed in a separation of powers in the government. He thought that when a government acted, it should act according to a set of laws. Basically, what we're seeing here is the idea of 
a separation between a legislative and executive branch, right? The legislative being the ones that you know makes the laws and the executive branch then following these existing laws. So early ideas of separation of the powers of government. Now, all of these thinkers that we're talking about were shaped by the world that they lived in, and they're all products of that world, right? So that means that they fit into that world. Like, they, they may be saying revolutionary things, but in many ways, their views have been shaped by everything that they're around. And so, we see in Locke uh, some very hypocritical stances on the issue of slavery. He made a lot of money through the slave trade, and early in his life, he wrote a treatise that was for the colonists in the Carolinas, so what would later become North and South Carolina. Um, when it was still a colony, he wrote a treatise that gave the masters there absolute power over the slaves that they owned. Now, later in his life, he wrote that slaves had no obligation to be obedient. So we see this very hypocritical view on slavery. You know, he made a lot of money on it early on. He was arguing for masters having absolute power while also saying later in his life that slaves really had no obligation to be obedient to their masters. Um, and again, that's a product of the world that he grew up in. And that kind of goes along with this last point that we're going to make. He also wrote that man was born a tabula rasa, a blank slate. Man is shaped by his experiences. So in many ways, his views on, you know, his very conflicting views on slavery fit this, right? Because he was shaped by the world that he grew up in. This is kind of a, it, it, it seems, you know, so common at this point, like a, like a really just simple idea. But basically what this was doing was this was going against what the church had been telling people for years that, you know, that man had original sin. He was born already with sin. Um, but at the same time, this also is going against something Descartes had said, where Descartes felt that man was born uh, innately logical. Like, immediately, man was this logical creature. And Locke doesn't agree with either of those. He's not some... He says that man is not some, you know, just naturally evil being, but at the same time, he's not this naturally uh, gifted in logic creature either. Instead, man is shaped by the experiences. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's Locke. We can see some very, very important ideas that he had. Now, the last man that we're going to lo look at before we get into the heart of the Enlightenment, is Pierre uh, Bale. He was a French philosopher who at one time was a Huguenot and at another time a Catholic. So he, you know, kind of was both, a, he, he, was, he was both of these at different times. And what he is best known for is writing what was called the Historical and Critical Dictionary. And he wrote this in 1697, he added a second edition of it in 1702, and this was so influential that it was actually translated into English in 1709. Now, it's called the Historical and Critical Dictionary, but it's not really a dictionary at all in the sense that we use the word dictionary. Instead, what it was was a collection of essays organized by topic title in alphabetical order. So basically, it was an encyclopedia before that term uh, really existed or was common. Each article explored its topic skeptically and rigorously. So we keep seeing this, saying this word skeptical, 
right? So everything is being explored skeptically and rigorously. It was also very tolerant of many different views, you know, which is not surprising if the writer was both a Huguenot and a Catholic at different times in his life, probably much like Henri IV, going to be tolerant. So these were some of the major influences on the Enlightenment, and now we can discuss some of the major contributors themselves to the Enlightenment. And these figures kind of get grouped together in what we call the le philosophe, the French word basically for philosophers, right? Uh, for our lecture, we're going to mainly look at French philosophes, or you know, people who at least spoke French, uh, but we should remember that the Enlightenment included others, like Ben Franklin in the United States, David Hume in Britain, Immanuel Kant in the German states, and Cesare Beccaria in what would later become Italy. So, the Enlightenment isn't limited to France, but we're going to focus there. Just like how when we talked about the Renaissance we focused in Florence, this is going to be a focus in France. And of course when we're talking about Le Philosophe, we're talking about this collection of philosophers and not the um, cafe in Paris. What a lovely little cafe that is though. Look at that. Who wouldn't want to go there and just pass the day away? But no, we're talking about people like Montesquieu. Charles Louis de Secunda, the Baron de Montesquieu, or as we'll call him Montesquieu, he was a noble and a lawyer on top of being a philosopher, right? Basically, everybody that we're going to talk about today is also a philosopher. He wrote quite a few important works. And we're going to be concerned mainly with two of them. The first is called The Spirit of the Laws, written in 1748. And in it, he stated that there were three major types of government that man created. A re the Republic, the Monarchy, and Despotism. Furthermore, you could break down the Republic into a Democratic Republic or an Aristocratic the pub, uh, republic, based on, you know, who got to vote, right? A democratic republic would be everybody would get to vote for um, their leaders, whereas an aristocratic was confined to just a certain number of people. Um, people with special status would be able to get to vote who could rule. Um, you know, ideally, America is a democratic republic, and hopefully we are not moving towards an aristocratic one. Now, he also expanded on Locke a bit in terms of the separation of powers. Remember, Locke kind of was talking about how there was the, this legislative, there should be a, a, a separation between the legislative and the executive. Well, Montesquieu actually lays out that the separation of powers needs to be the executive, the legislative, and the judicial powers of the state need to be separated. And obviously, this is profoundly impactful on the United States, right? There's a reason why we have Congress being the legislative branch, the president being the executive, and then the Supreme Court being the judicial powers. Montesquieu lays this out. Our founders understood that this should exist, and hopefully, you know, most Americans understand this as well, because that's the way our government is set up, based upon these ideas of Montesquieu. He also argued for freedom of thought and speech and assembly in this, and he argued against slavery in this work as well. The other work that we should, that we're going to mention is uh, the Persian letters, lettre person. Uh, these were basically a, a grand collection of letters uh, that criticized French society. And Montesquieu safely does this by saying that he was just translating these letters that were actually to and from the Persian ambassador. 
So all these things that are being said critically about France, you know, like any criticisms made, he's not taking any responsibility. He's just translating letters from or to and from the Persian ambassador when in fact he was writing them himself. Uh, now, why did he need to hide his criticism, you know, behind this this theoretical Persian ambassador? Well, basically, he did not want to receive a lettre de cachet. And here is a lettre de cachet. Basically, this was a blank arrest warrant. And an offended noble could just put so, write someone's name on it, and that person would be arrested without a trial, and they didn't really have a chance to defend themselves. Once, these, once they were arrested, they would be sent to a prison for an unspecified amount of time. It could be, you know, a day, a week, years, months, you know, it, it, there was no specific time, there was going to be no trial, uh, and one of the prisons that people were sent to was this building here. Uh, this is the Bastille. It originally had been an old castle that was used to protect Paris, but eventually it would kind of become a political prison. And because of the status of it being a political prison, it will be important later in this semester. But it's also important today, right? I mean, it's a political prison, and in fact, we're going to see somebody who's going to spend some time here. The next figure that we should talk about is Francois-Marie Auré, or as he would uh, write, or as the name that he penned for himself, Voltaire, right? So whenever he was working, he wrote under the name Voltaire. He was a writer, a historian, a philosopher, obviously, and, you know, dabbled in the sciences too. And he wrote about just just about every genre that you can write, uh, he wrote something in. Uh, these include plays, poems, essays, histories. Uh, <clears throat> one of his poems was even this grand epic poem, you know, this really, really long epic poem that he tried to imitate the Roman poet Virgil in, um, but his, his, uh, subject was Henri the Fourth, and he depicted him as this national hero mainly because of his passing of the Edict of Non, that religious tolerance um, edict that we saw. So, you know, plays, poems, epic poems, essays. When he wrote his histories, he wrote them using a very skeptical and careful examination. Um, of the events and the details. You know, he would sort out, or try to sort out the best he could, what was, what actually happened, what were just stories that people had made up, you know. Um, he really wanted to get to the truth. And unlike other histories up until this time, he focused on a society's culture, its arts, its science, uh, not war and diplomacy. Basically from the, the time of, you know, Herodotus of the ancient Greeks onward, historians had focused on war and diplomacy and, you know, politicians. Instead, Voltaire focused on a society's culture. And this was a huge change in history, um, a, a major shift in historiography. So, He's very important for that. He also didn't limit his histories uh, to be about the cultures of Europe. He especially loved to examine uh, Islamic countries, and he loved to see how Islamic states influenced medieval Europe. He was a strong supporter of tolerance, 
but at the same time, he was very, very critical of Christian churches, uh, especially the Catholic Church. So while he's preaching tolerance, he's very, very harsh towards Christianity in general. You know, mainly because he saw them as bullies. So his major weapon for criticizing not only the church, but nobles, uh, you know, anyone, was through a type of work called satire. So he would write these satires full of criticism, and one such satire even accused a cousin of the king um, of incest. So in one of his satires, he says, hey, the cousin of the king, uh, he had incest. And because of this, he actually did receive a letter de cachet, and he spent 11 months in the Bastille. He's finally released after 11 months, and wouldn't you know it, uh, didn't really seem to, to, to learn to, you know, not to be critical of other people, because he would later uh, insult a, another French nobleman, and as a result, he was beaten, and he was about to receive another lettre de cachet, uh, and when he found out about this, he instead uh, exiled himself to England, right? I mean, you receive a second lettre de, lettre de cachet, he, you might never get out. The first one, he had spent 11 months in the Bastille, he might never get out uh, after receiving a second one. So, instead he, you know, fled to England, and there he was able to spend a lot of time among the intellectuals there. And they would have, you know, he was able to share ideas with them and pick up a lot of influence from them. He was also able to see firsthand the constitutional monarch system that England developed and the greater freedom of speech that they uh, were allowed. You know, greater freedom of the press, too. And he really... This would, seeing these these types of government and these type of freedoms would have a major influence on his own political thoughts. Despite this, you know, being accepted into England, uh, he was still not the biggest fan of England. And in fact, he would return to France, you know, after things calmed down, uh, after some years things calmed down, so he returns to France, where... He worked very closely with a married noblewoman, the Marquise du Châtelet. She kind of acted as both the patron of Voltaire and his lover. Uh, so they were they were together for quite a quite a number of years, and he would live at her live with her on her husband's estate. And this estate featured a massive library. And there they were able to study together many different subjects, including science and history. Now, we're talking about the Enlightenment. We're talking about these greater freedoms. We've seen Voltaire um, spend time in England and really start to favor the idea of constitutional monarchy. And it might I don't know, maybe it's just our our modern sensibilities uh, to think that maybe Voltaire uh, was a strong proponent of democracy, but that wasn't the case at all. <clears throat> in fact, he never really trusted democracy. He wrote in, in one of his letter, letters to Catherine the Great, the Empress of Russia, uh, almost nothing great has ever been done in the world except by the genius and firmness of a single man combating the prejudices of the multitude. Basically what he's saying is that you need a strong figure to overcome the the craziness and stupidity of most of the people. And I'm sure that come, you know, when when it when January rolled around and of 2017, if Voltaire was still around, he'd probably uh, feel very, very justified. 
So instead of democracy, what Voltaire believed in was the idea of a philosopher king or an enlightened despot, an enlightened monarch. Um, basically, he wanted people to be ruled by a king who was wise like a philosopher. Well, how did this king become wise like a philosopher? He would have been trained by philosophers like Voltaire, right? So, this king or queen, even, um, they would be infused with these, with the ideas and um, goals of the Enlightenment, and they would become the perfect ruler for a state. This is what Voltaire believed was the perfect form of government. And so he has this idea of this philosopher king, this enlightened despot, and he thinks he's found one in Frederick the Great of Prussia. Now, we mentioned Catherine the Great of Russia, Russia being, you know, still the state that exists. Prussia is one of the many German states of this time, and as we'll see later in the semester, it is going to be one of the key players in the creation of the country of Germany. So Frederick the Great is the ruler of this large German state called Prussia. And they had been writing letters back and forth to each other, and they just were, you know, seeing eye to eye, and just, you know, they were like, buddy, buddy, everything is going great. And, you know, Frederick, he likes many things that intellectuals like. Like, he composed music. He loved poetry. Um, and through their letters, Frederick the Great asks Voltaire to come to Prussia and join his court. So, Voltaire, in 1750, agrees to this, and he travels to Prussia. And he becomes a member of the court of Frederick. And while Frederick, you know, had these, this great love for intellectual pursuits, he was also very militaristic and very stern and kind of strong, uh, strong-headed, right? He was headstrong, um, a little stubborn. So, basically, these qualities of Frederick the Great quickly dis disillusioned Voltaire, uh, and he ends up leaving Prussia, pretty quickly, and while he's coming home, you know, he wants to return to Paris then, he was actually banned from returning to Paris. <laughs> and he was forced to kind of live for many, many years in Switzerland and just across the border in France. He'd kind of go back and forth trying to find a, a place to, to stay for many years. Uh, he finally would return to Paris after 25 years, um, and, yeah, once he returned to Paris, he, uh, eventually died. It was a, it was a hard trip there. He was an old man and got sick. Uh, he really wanted to put on a, a play there, um, but he got sick and kind of, you know, just eventually dies, um, from being, you know, well, weak and, weaker and old, um. And this is uh, Frederick the Great of Prussia, who Voltaire hoped would be his um, enlightened monarch, his enlightened despot. But not really the case. So we mentioned the Marquise du Châtelet. You know, she, when we were mentioning Voltaire, she was the patron and a lover of Voltaire. Uh, they worked together. And she's a mathematician, a physicist, and a philosopher. Now, because she worked very closely with Voltaire, she can kind of get lost in history, um, you know, overshadowed by Voltaire. Uh, but there's also one um, trait that also leads to her being kind of overshadowed in the Enlightenment, 
and that is that she was a woman, right? And in fact, Voltaire, uh, in a letter to Frederick the Great, he said of her, she was a great man whose only fault was being a woman. Now think about that for a moment. Um, you know, basically Voltaire is saying that if she was a man, you know, she would have all the credit in the world. She was, she would be truly recognized for how great she was. Um, but unfortunately she was a woman. So much of society, uh, wouldn't be able to overlook that. But she was a very amazing and brilliant person. By the age of 12, besides being fluent in her, for, in her, um, you know, native French, she was fluent in Latin and Greek and German and Italian. In her teens, when she needed money for, uh, you know, to buy books, the way she raised money was she developed strategies to win at gambling, right? She was this mathematical, um, you know, savant who just could develop these strategies to win at gambling. Later in her life, she actually predicted infrared radiation. Uh, she was working on studying fire, and she predicted what would later be found as infrared radiation. She is especially known for two big works. She wrote on the foundations of physics, and this was circulated widely throughout France and even translated into, into many different languages. And she did this in 1740, is when she wrote that. And in 1749, she finished a translation of Newton's Principia. Newton had, had uh, wrote this in... Latin, and she translated it into French. And not only did she just translate it, she also provided a commentary for it. So she understood what he was saying, and she was able to, you know, comment on it and um, actually break it down a bit. <clears throat> so this was written in 1749, and it would be published 10 years later. Unfortunately, that was 10 years after she died giving birth to her fourth child. So she finished this this work of um, translating and commenting on Newton's work, and just a few months later, she dies in childbirth, or due to complications from childbirth. But a very, very amazing woman um, who would have a great influence on a specific piece of work that we're going to look at next. And this work is closely associated with these two men, Denis Diderot and Jean Le Ronde de Alembert. Now, Denis Diderot uh, was an art critic and a writer, as well as a philosopher. De Alembert was a mathematician, a physicist, a musical theorist, on top of being a philosopher as well. And these two were the co-editors of l'encyclopedia, the encyclopedia. Diderot would edit the literary topics, and d'Alembert handled the scientific, which is not surprising, right? I mean, one's an, a writer and an art critic, the other is a physicist and a mathematician. It would make sense that, um, you know, Diderot would handle the literary topics, d'Alembert would handle the scientific. So let's look at l'encyclopedia. The encyclopedia, uh, or as it's called, uh, the encyclopedia or a systematic dictionary of the sciences, arts, and crafts, and we can see that here, encyclopedia or the dic or you know a, a systematic dictionary of the sciences, the arts, and crafts. Um, originally, it was conceived to be. It was conceived as a translation of an English work called the Cyclopedia. And the Cyclopedia in England covered just the arts and sciences. Um, but these French writers quickly changed their goal from translating this smaller work into this enormous goal of trying to assemble all knowledge throughout the world. 
and put it into the encyclopedia. It was published from 1751 to 1772, and it was published in Paris. Now, I haven't really mentioned this yet, but you can see here on the cover page, there it says, in Paris. So, unlike the other works that we've talked about so far, the works of uh, Voltaire and the works of Montesquieu, uh, those were published either in the Netherlands, places like Rotterdam, Amsterdam, or in Switzerland, places like Geneva. Because there was really strong censorship in France, and anything like the Persian letters just would not get past the censors, or, you know, anything, uh, any of the satires that Voltaire wrote. There's no way that the censors in France would allow those to be written. So they were published instead in the Netherlands or Switzerland. Now, early on, the encyclopedia we see was published in Paris. And it originally was actually approved of by the king, Louis XV. Diderot had these great connections um, with nobles who, you know, saw the the good that would come from trying to assemble all of the knowledge. But eventually this, well, really quickly actually, this endorsement by the king and, you know, it would be removed really quickly. And we'll kind of get into why in just a moment. But before we get into that, I just want to say this was a, an immense work. 17 volumes that were devoted to articles, and another 11 of them that were uh, devoted to illustrations. And this was a really, really pricey subscription, too. Um, it would cost a lot to, to own these. Now, the articles that were written, and this is what made the, the king eventually take away his endorsement, well, they were written by the most famous French scholars of the time. Not only Diderot and D'Alembert, but Montesquieu and Voltaire were writing in this, as well as other um, of the you know, famous French scholars, people who may be critical of France, like Voltaire um, and Montesquieu could be. So you can imagine that you know, with people writing like this and a work that was meant to be very tolerant of just about very tolerant of every view, right? I mean, it's trying to have all the knowledge in the world and it's trying to do it balanced and fairly. And yeah, so that's why this eventually would lose its endorsement from the king. So let's take a look at some of these, um, some of what the, the encyclopedia would look like. Well, like we said, it covered the sciences, and we could see on the left, anatomy, right? It's a detailed drawings of anatomy, as well as on the right we see about natural history, and this being about flowers and, and plants. Also, the arts. Uh, on the left, we have a plate devoted to a French song about the, you know, a French song called Wolf Hunt, right? So you can see there are the notes for it, and it even has tracks of wolves um, to kind of go along with the theme. And on the right, we have the Japanese alphabet. So they were really trying to assemble every piece of knowledge that they could. And it wasn't just limited to the sciences and arts like the cyclopedia had been in Britain, but like we said, it included crafts. And we can see on the left detailed drawings of um, the tools used in engraving. And on the right, there's a, a schematic breakdown of a paper mill. And you can see how the, the, the machines would work together, um, you know, or the, the devices would work together. Uh, so this was very, very detailed uh, works in, in this encyclopedia. 
So, along with Voltaire and Montesquieu, the last person that we're going to talk about today uh, in this lecture also wrote for uh, the encyclopedia, also contributed articles, and that is Jean-Jacques Rousseau. He was a French-speaking Swiss um, writer, composer, and obviously a philosopher. So he spoke French, but he was from Switzerland. And in many ways, we can kind of see Jean-Jacques Rousseau as um, an anti-philosoph. So we've been talking about all these philosophs. Jean-Jacques Rousseau kind of fits in with them, but in especially in one key area that we'll talk about in just a second, he his view is almost anti-philosoph. He wrote a number of works. I've just included four here. Uh, first one is called Emile, or On Education. He also wrote a work called Julie, or The New Heloise. Uh, he wrote a discourse on inequality, and he wrote a very famous work called The Social Contract. And through works like these and his other works, um, he revolutionized views on a number of issues, including childhood. So like Locke, he believed that children were not born evil, but they were born neutral, right? Kind of like that tabula rasa that Locke was talking about. Uh, Rousseau saw them as these neutral figures who were shaped by education, right? So you have these, these figures that need to be shaped and civilized by education, and in fact, they were not little adults. And this sounds kind of weird, because, again, you know, we've been... Our thoughts have been influenced highly by people like Rousseau. Um, but when Rousseau was writing, people kind of viewed children as just little adults. We talked about how the church said that man was born with original sin and, you know, tended to be evil. So, you know, children were thought to be like these people that you had to like, you know, break away from the evil. And... I, I keep mentioning that they're not little adults. There were actual punishments at this time, uh, when you know, before Rousseau, of adults being treated just like children, like being hanged um, for crimes. So these little children were, you know, punished just as adults uh, by law um, for their mistakes, because they were just seen as little adults and these little corrupt beings. <clears throat> Rousseau goes against that and says, you know, education is what civilizes children. And in when he's talking about education, he's, he believes that children should learn through play and through games and interacting with each other and interacting with adults. And that's how children should learn. Uh, and this goes against the traditional way of learning, which was just through memorization um, that was, you know, kind of pushed by punishment, right? If you made a mistake, you'd get like a slap with a ruler or, um, yeah, or just through reading books alone. And here we kind of, th this idea of that it's through living instead of just through books starts to kind of not mesh exactly with other philosophs during the Enlightenment, but it's especially his bel belief on the feelings that um, are very, very against other philosophs. <clears throat> he believed that feelings were natural and needed to be expressed. And he felt that, you know, your a, a person's mind and, you know, their ability to reason those are, that's a great thing, but a complete person has feelings as their guide, right? So feelings work along with reason. And just think about that for a second. We talked about how 
people would take reason during the you know in the during the French Revolution, which was highly influenced by these figures, reason became the supreme being. Rousseau is saying that you know reason's not the guide of someone. Instead, the feelings work with reason to help guide and create a person as a complete and good person. So very, very against other views of uh, Le Philosophe. He also um, <clears throat> was very influential in politics, revolutionized the views of politics. He said, all people are equal. So again, going against the divine rights. Um, and that people should have the right to choose their government and the laws um, for themselves. The leaders then should follow the views of the people. Now, this does not just mean he supported democracy. I mean, obviously, democracy fits very well with this. But if the people determine that what would work best for them is a monarchy, then that's the type of, go the type of government that they should have. But those monarchs need to follow the views of the people and work for them. And this is all kind of um, lumped together into what is called the general will. Mainly that, you know, the people know what type of government is best for them. <clears throat> I said with Locke that these people were, um, that all these figures that we talked about today were shaped by the society that they lived in, and Rousseau is no different. While he says all people are equal, um, Rousseau in many ways, again, you know, a product of the world that he grew up in, <clears throat> was a strong um, believer in gender roles. Now, all people are equal, but men have different skills that they're better at than women and women have different better different skills that they're better at um and he didn't really believe much in a gender equality that's it's hard to explain this like so he you know he just felt that that men could do certain things better than women and women could do certain things better than men and in those sense they were equal, like they could create an equal partnership through the combining of the the strong the, the strengths of the of the men and the strengths of the women. But you know, it, women should not be studying or should not have certain roles in society. Um, so this is, you know, uh, he has very very many influential ideas on our society. But at the same time, at least in terms of gender. Uh, he would be far off of what many people believe today. Um, so we'll kind of end there um, on the Enlightenment and just kind of, you know, think back at how we saw inductive reasoning and reason become so, such a strong part of thought. Um, and even we get to the point where Rousseau kind of goes, you know, re where maybe we're making a little too much of reason. You know, you need to have some of your feelings um, involved in there. So that's where we'll end today. Um, we'll end this lecture there. This is Greg signing off.